Uh, let's just start. Let's be start uh, thanking our speakers, thanking uh, Roderick Guigo, who will be uh, our speaker today. And so, uh, Roderick graduated uh, uh, as a PhD from uh, Barcelona University. I could not find the exact year, Roderick. Which year did you graduate? Is it is it a secret or something? <laughs> year or century? Are you talking about what is the precision that you want? I I I, I need the full numbers to be on the safe side. <laughs> in, no, no, eighty eight. In eighty eight. In eighty eight. So Roderick graduated in eighty eight from uh, Barcelona University, and uh, rapidly he got. I don't think he was so much in genomics at the time, but uh, while being a postdoc in the US, he really became interested in genomics and uh, spent quite some time in the lab of uh, Temple Smith. Uh, uh, some of you may remember Temple Smith from the Smith and Waterman algorithm, not, not Smith and Wesson, Smith and Waterman algorithm, where Temple Smith was actually that Smith. And so this is where Roderick got interested in gene prediction, I believe, and where he started working on the topic of gene prediction that get him really into uh, alternative splicing and, and understanding the intricacies of uh, the maturation of transcripts in a cell. And that's, of course, one of the reasons why Roderick was so central in uh, key projects and flagship projects like the ENCOD projects, where uh, 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 aside from being one of the leaders of the project, Roderick was also uh, uh, instrumental in exploring the quantification of uh, alternative isoforms across tissues. And as some of you know, this led to a project that are quite relevant to this working group, since uh, it led to the ENCOD Compara project, where human and mouse were carefully compared. And uh, uh, aside from this, Roderick was also uh, very involved in the GTEx project, which is this very large scale project in which uh, 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 tissues have been uh, sequenced across individuals in the U.S., uh, recently deceased individual in the U.S., to try to quantify the relative amounts of transcripts. Now, I, I, I could spend uh, a long time, I could spend an hour and more, a whole day, talking about everything Roderick has done, because there are a few aspects of mathematics in which he hasn't had uh, a significant impact. But uh, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, mention few recent projects like the Earth Biogenome Project, in which uh, he has been uh, actively leading the Catalan chapter, and uh, 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 is, which is becoming uh, an important component of this, uh, of this essential project for a field like ours, animal genomics, especially because what do we have in Europe? We have the Catalan chapter, and we have the British chapter, the Darwin Tree of Life. So this is the kind of uh, things uh, uh, Roderick is now doing. And, uh, you know, just to give a few numbers, uh, the metrics of Roderick are insane. You know, looking at uh, Google Scholar, I found 169,000 citations, which is, you know, it's usually the number. Probably they have some, uh, they, 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 they have some saturation filter at some point. They cannot count accurately. And he has an H index of 130. So that's quite a privilege to be, to be hosting Roderick today. As a parenthesis, Roderick has always been uh, very involved in uh, making sure that uh, the uh, less official languages find their way into science. And uh, recently, he has uh, spearheaded the uh, publication of uh, translated, uh, translated uh, abstracts, uh, including in NatureCom, in uh, Now Genomics and Bioinformatics, where the abstracts are translated in Catalan. And okay. I understand that this is an important aspect of uh, of the Earth biogenome. Uh, uh, what? I know, Eric, that you don't. Uh, we are we are not exactly in the same uh, thinking here, but yes, I really appreciate your support. We don't we don't coincide, and I have uh, I have very very I'm strong not, ideas on on the fact that English oh, should be the, yeah. the the only scientific language. But I do I do support, and I do understand. The import, you know, we probably do not coincide in how to maintain languages and why uh, 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 we, we coincide in the necessity of maintaining languages, but we don't necessarily coincide in the fact that scientific uh, uh, communication shall be translated. But still, you know, you're pushing this. A lot of people appreciate it. 
you are bringing the science closer to the taxpayers, to the language of the taxpayers, and I don't think there can be anything bad about this. And you know, I, it's it's a matter for an interesting debate, and maybe not something online. We need we need beer. <laughs> but anyway, Roderick, thanks a lot for talking here. Uh, why are we hosting Roderick today? Just a few words. It's because Roderick has always been on the forefront of animal of of human. Uh, uh, genomics and whatever happens in human genomics always happens later in animal genomics. So I think a community like ours, the NFCore animal uh, uh, genomics community, that is people using NFCore tools to analyze animal genomics data, our community must keep an eye on what is going on on human because whatever is going on on human will happen in animals and in many ways what we call FANG is actually anchored for farmed animals. And so without further ado, Roderick, thanks a lot. Sorry for the small audience. I hope we will have a lot of uh, view on YouTube and this will make up for this uh, small audience and the work you've put in this presentation. And I leave you the floor. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Sadiq, for your really nice introduction, your keen words. And I really appreciate it because even disagreeing with me and the term of the language, you've been very supportive that non-nucleic acid research in innovation bioinformatics has been pioneering this, actually. Margaret Louis, right? How is this, Margaret, Margaret? What is this famous Molière? The medicine, the, the medicine Margaret Louis? Or the medicine like... Margaret Louis, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the same idea anyway. So let me share my screen. So actually, well, it's not really, a... I will, I will make it a spoil, right? But I will, so my talk, so it's, a, you see it, right? My, uh, so actually it's a good day. It's a good day uh, to make this presentation because today is the last day in the history of humankind that there are 20,000 long non-coding RNAs in the human genome. Tomorrow there will be 40,000. So I think it's, uh, I think it's very appropriate. So let me, let me, I will talk about Finding genes in the human genome. It's a little bit, yeah. Um, I sorry, what are wait, wait, may, may, maybe we will all go and invest a bit of money on long non-coding RNA companies, and, and we'll come back to your talk later. <laughs> okay, good. So anyway, so I, I as I said, I I don't think I need to. I don't. I think that I don't need in this audience to to emphasize why it's important to have a, a good gene notation of genomes. I, I think it's yeah, in a sense. Uh, I started working on gene finding more than 30 years ago. I think we published the first paper in 1992. So this is 32 years ago when I was with Temple Smith and um, some how is sobering that, that now after all these years, we still have so many genes to be discovered in the human genome. And uh, well, essentially, uh, I think that these are the reasons why uh, uh, gene notation is very important, right? I mean, you can really, you can really infer very little of the biology of uh, an organism from its genome unless you have a map of where the genes are. And also it's very difficult to interpret in particular all the omics measures meant to do that with the genome uh, unless you have really a good annotation. And, uh, and this is a uh, typical, this is, uh, this is what we mean by annotation so that we are all on the same page. So this is just a map on the genome of the position of the genes and transcripts are of the exonic structure, right? That's what we, that's a view of a, of a genome browser. And when we have a new genome, what do we want that we want? This is always the first step, is to build this map. And just because of uh, some sort of historical perspective, I would say that this is the first genome browser shot. It was taken uh, more than 100 years ago. Uh, it was taken before the concept of genome existed before we knew what the genes were, before we knew how the what was the material in which the chromosomes were made. But essentially, the same thing that we uh, that we understand as a genome browser today is just the linear representation of a chromosome, where the positions of the genes are displayed, and these are the positions of five genes on the linear chromosome of a Drosophila. Uh, this produced early in the past century, as I said, without any knowledge of the genome sequence, what the genome was, where the chromosomes were made from, 
what the genes were, right? This was just based on the frequency with which two characters segregated together in, in flies. And the more often two characters are segregated together, the hypothesis of Morgan and his student Sturtevant was that they were closer in whatever was what chromosomes were made of. And I think it was really a great intuition. Uh, we need to jump many years uh, to the sequencing of the human genome uh, uh, at the early early in the century, almost 100 years later, to have the full uh, complete sequence of the, of the human genome. And uh, right after the sequencing of the human genome, uh, a number of projects were uh, started uh, with the aim of understanding how the genome sequence function. And one of the most famous ones probably probably heard about it is the I think Sarah has heard about it quite a few, uh, a few uh, is the the encode project the encyclopedia of DNA elements. And within this project, uh, one of the projects that was started also together with the encode actually as part of a part of encode in 2003 with Gencode. And Gencode is an international project that aims to build this map of genes and transcripts from the human and the mouse genomes. And uh, this is considered uh, what's called a global core biodata resources. These are uh, it's like a handful of these resources that are considered of strategic importance uh, for, bio, uh, for biology and life sciences. Uh, this is the current, so the, the project has been the, the the components of the project have been evolved during the years. Uh, we have been part of GenCode from the, from the beginning, in the sense uh, I was the PI in the pilot phase. Uh, now, in addition to our group, so there are groups from the MIT, from the Spanish Cancer National Research Center, the CENIO, the University of California, Stanford and Yale, and this has, has everything co coordinated with the, with the EMBL EBI. Uh, so, for you to give you an idea of the relevance of what I'm going to, or lack of relevance of what I'm going to present today, the number of genes, annotated genes in GenCode, have remained quite stable for the last 10 years at least or more. Right? This, this could suggest that we have really a quite good annotation of the human genome, that we have a good understanding of, of, of where the genes and transcripts in the human genome are. But while this may be true for protein coding genes, because the different there are not many different catalogs out there, it's RepSeq. Essentially, there are two main catalogs of human genes, one is RepSeq uh, and the other is uh, GenCode, both, by the way, funded by the NIH. Uh, uh, funded, uh, it's always a little bit surprising that the NIH funds two competing projects, but uh, it's good. Uh, but there are other uh, if in the case of long non-coding carnase, that's very long non-coding carnase. This the situation is very different, right? There are many different uh, catalogs out there which share only a fraction of the of the of the genes and the, of the long non-coding carnase annotated there, and they are based on on different criteria using different methods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's quite unclear. Uh, for the community, right? What whether there is a whether there is a solid and reliable catalog of, of low non coding carnets that can be used. So a little bit with the aim of trying to put some order onto this uh, sort of uh, chaotic, I mean chaotic uh, field. Uh, we we within GenCode we aim to, to try to, well, actually, we, we carry out probably the largest effort to characterize the long non-coding carnate complement of the, of the human genome. And for that, we, we use uh, an approach, which we call, call, call CLS, Capture Long Range Sequencing, that we had already published many years ago, uh, group, in which rather than sequencing, rather than sequencing uh, the RNA unbiased from the cell, so we try to enrich from RNAs coming from particular regions of the genome. 
right? So we enrich for RNAs from the regions, and then uh, we sequence specifically the RNAs in principle that are coming from from these from these regions, right? The rationale is that there are RNAs that are lowly expressed, or that they are highly expressed, but only on small population of cells. We've seen bulk rna experiments, and they are not very well represented when we do standard rna -seq. So if we suspect that there are regions in the genome that may be encoding genes, maybe we can try to really focus specifically on the regions and sequence only the RNAs that are coming from the regions where we have a higher probability of capturing them. And for sequencing, once, once we capture these RNAs, we sequence them using non read technologies of Sonar or PacBio. And we use and we use a method that we developed together with the Riken Institute that actually tries to produce full length sequences from the transcription star side to the transcription terminated, uh, termination side. So that's the that's the that's the protocol that that's the experimental approach that we use. By the way, we think within uh, even though we are we are a computational group within code were ironically tasked with the production of experimental data. Uh, this is the design, our capture uh, design. So these are the regions of the genome that we capture. Right? These are the number of elements that we capture. Uh, sorry, this is mostly uh, uh, annotations of long non-coding RNA. So the long non-coding this, this, this catalogs predict long non-coding RNA based mostly on short rate data. We take them and we specifically amplify the regions where this where this uh, where these long encoding arrays are annotated, the ones that are outside from same code, and then we also target other regions, for instance, enhancers, regions CM finders, CRS. These are regions that are predicted to encode RNAs with the structures. Pilos SF are regions that are that are that have a conservation of uh, protein coding function, and GWAS are uh, regions that have GWAS SNPs, and you see is also conserved elements, etc., etc. In total, so to give you an idea, we target 2.5% of the human and mouse genome approximately. So essentially, our aim is to sequence only the RNAs that are coming from this 2%, 2-3% of the 2-3% of the human and mouse genomes. And this is the this is the experimental design. These are so these are the samples that we profile. We, we profile four tissues. Uh, match tissues in human and mouse, both, and adults and embryo, uh, plus some additional uh, pools of, of cells and tissues to maximize transcriptome complexity. And we sequence them, uh, we, we sequence them both pre-capture, standard RNA-seq, and post-capture. Uh, and uh, we use uh, three different platforms, PacBio and Oxford Nanopore, Long read, long read RNA sequencing technologies, and then short read sequencing, and that produce a large uh, data set uh, with uh, almost 100 long read RNA data sets with 700 million long reads. It's one of the largest, as far as I can tell, long read RNA data sets producing in human. Okay, then we have these reads, and from these reads, we have to we have to produce transcript models. Just think that I want to emphasize. And of course, this is just my word. These RNAs are of quite high quality, right? These are uh, produced in particular the pac bio ones. So they are uh, high chance of being enriched for full length from transcription ester side to transcription termination side. And uh, we use a method. So there are many methods to, to develop, to infer transcript models from the long read RNA read. So Ideally, you would think that if you have if you have a full length RNA transcript, that's enough. You map it, it and then you have a transcript. That's of course the ideal situation, but often this is not the case. You still need to make an effort to build to build uh, to build models from from long read RNA uh, reads. In particular, if you don't use these technologies that try to enrich for full length transcripts like the CapTrap uh, uh, sec that I, that I presented. And this is an evaluation. This is an evaluation of, uh, of, of methods that build reads from 
that build models from long return on acid rates, right? This is uh, LRGAS, uh, it was called LRGAS, this was a community experiment that has been recently published in Measure Methods. And these are different methods that are used to taking the long read. In this case, all these methods, they took the same set of long read RNA seq reads and they produce transcript models. And uh, I just, irrespective of the method that we use, the one that we develop and the performance of this method, I just want you to, I just want to emphasize that that's a little bit, I would say, sovereign as well, no? Because you would say that, well, I have a long read, right? A read that has 1,000 bases long. Of course, it's interrupted by introns, but it should not be so difficult to align into the sequence of the human genome, right? It should not be, it shouldn't be not much uncertainty. And yet, you see that there are programs that on the same set of reads produce 270,000 models and programs that produce 9,000 models. So something, a problem that, a bioinformatic problem that apparently it's relatively straightforward, it is more difficult to solve than anticipated. And actually, we use the program that produced the less number of models, LIDIC, which we developed. And I'm emphasizing this. I'm not going to comment about the qualities of this program compared to the others, but I'm, I just want to emphasize that this is the most conservative. Right, is the one that giving the set of reads produces the less number of models, right? Because I think this, this sort of, I think it's important to have this in mind when I give you the numbers that I'm going to give you now, right? So this is the most conservative of all the programs that build models from long recurrent reads. So when we use this program in our data set, we create in total one million, more than one million transcripts. If you ignore variations on the termini of these transcripts, right? Many of the differences between transcripts are just because the 5 prime or the 3 prime are different. We will get about half a million different intron change you want, right? Transcripts that are uh, not only different at the termini, but they also differ in some intron. And many of which were novel and many of which occur in places that were totally annotated up into the intergenic transcripts. And uh, I want to emphasize that we could discover this essentially because we were using the capture approach, right? So the vast majority of these things that that have not seen before, that have not seen before, and actually that have not seen before, uh, say it in quotes, because we will see what this means exactly, um, are are found only post capture, right? If we would not have done the post capture, the number of in novel intersonic transcripts would have been much much lower, right? I mean, compared to a few thousands. Uh, okay, this is this is a so gen code as I said is a consortium. We produce experiment. This this is where our task finalized, right? We produce the models. These models are given to these models are given to the Havana team at the EBI. And the Havana team is a team of manual curators that actually typically work on a locus by locus basis. So they look at the very locus. They look at all the evidence and make calls at the end of the transcript structures that are acceptable according to the criteria of the of the Havana team, the criteria of the Havana team. Uh, of course, if you give to them five, half, half a million in human and half a million in mouse, and that's that model of locus by locus manual curation, I think it's a little bit unfeasible. It would take maybe decades to analyze our data. So this actually has led to a, to a development of a workflow, which is a sort of semi-automated workflow that's manually curated at key points. So now because of the quality of the data that the long read sec technologies produce, the amount of manual curation that you need to make calls of genes has been reduced in part, in part because of the avalanche of data that we had produced that the Havana team could not, could not, uh, could not uh, cope with. 
So they use several filters to reduce to to, to make a conservative call for genes to be included into the annotation. And, uh, and one of the filters is a recount support of 50. This means the following. Recount is a database of about 400,000 short return and sick data sets that has been produced during the years all over the world, right? It's a huge data set. So a recount support of 50 means that every, every splice junction in our model, in one of our models, have to have at least 50 reads in recount, right? So this means the following. These transcripts have been seen before in a way or another, right? They have been represented in the RNA seq data sets, but nobody had pay attention to them, maybe because they were scattered across different data sets. So maybe in the data set there were 10 reads and nobody believed 10 reads. In the other set there were two reads supporting the same junction, nobody believed two reads. In the other data set there were five reads and nobody believed five reads. But what I can say is that the models that the subset of models that the Abana team considered for inclusion in the annotation, right, are strongly supported by independent evidence from short return and data datasets, even though they have never been included, most of them, in uh, in uh, in annotations. Uh, so this is uh, this is as a result. So we are including. 16,000 novel genes uh, plus 9,000 genes that have been modified. So essentially, 25,000 additional things in the in the in the, in the human genome and uh, 130,000 novel transcripts. So it's essentially a number of genes. We are multiplying by by two the number of genes annotated in gene code of long non-coding coronation annotated in gene code, and by three. The number of long non-coding coronaries annotated in uh, of, of transcripts by right? by two the number of genes and by three the number of transcripts and as I said this annotation which is the version 47 of gen code will be will be released tomorrow so that's what I say that today is the last day that there are 20,000 genes 20,000 long non-coding coronaries in the human genome and tomorrow there will be 40,000 and actually for mouse is even more impressive mouse uh, we are adding 22,000 novel genes, more than twice the number of genes that were annotated, and we multiply by six the number of annotated transcripts that are uh, in the mouse genome. Now, of course, the question that you will have is, uh, are these transcripts uh, doing anything other than being there? Uh, and, of course, that's a, a very valid question. We are, of course, very much interested into answering this question. Although from the Genko standpoint, that is not a very relevant question. No? The aim of Genko is to is to create a database in which every evidence of the existence of a transcript is included. So that every transcript and every gene that is supported by a RNA sequence that's not artifactual, that's reliable, that has been produced in one particular condition, is annotated. It's for the community to decide what is the functional biological value of this model, not for us. But of course, we are interested in knowing whether we are adding garbage to the garbage to the to the annotation or, or not. And uh, and we are still we're still um, working on we're still working on this. Uh, uh, but I will present some data that I think shows that the novel models that we are adding to GenCode are as good or bad as the previously annotated long non-coding RNAs, if not better. In general, I think that the long non-coding RNAs that we are adding to GenCode because of the our CLS work are actually overall better quality than the ones that have been annotated so far. So if you believe that the long non-coding RNAs that were annotated in GenCode were garbage, you probably will think that these are also garbage. If you believe that the London coding currencies that were annotated in GenCode were gold, these are better than gold or diamonds or something like that. So this is a few, that's a, let me show you a few analysis that we have done on this data set. So this is our novel CLS 
these are actually I didn't mention this, but of course, this novel transcript or whatever uh, give rise to novel transcription star sites. And of course, we look at the we look at the at the support that these transcription star sites had from orthogonal evidence and a very clear a very clear uh, evidence of transcription initiation is that we have gauge stacks, right? Gauge stacks is this short tax produced by the Phantom Consortium led by the Riken in which you probe specifically the five fragments of the genes and you sequence and Phantom Consortium has produced a large database of clusters of cage stacks, I think about 200,000 or something in the human genome. And we have just overlapped this cage with our DSSs. And about 11% of our 11% of our transcription star sites overlap with cage stacks. This is actually smaller than the Proportion of uh, uh, long non coding current uh, of annotated long non coding current is supported by cage stacks and substantially smaller, smaller than the fraction of protein coding transcription star sites supported by cage stacks. This is, however, not very surprising because our transcripts have been mostly discovered post capture, right? When we specifically target these regions of the genome and the cage data. Has not, it's not a targeted uh, data, it's just unbiased, right? Genome wide uh, sequencing of potential transcription star sites. So I think it's normal that we, that we don't have the same level of support on these things that are difficult to find when we look at, at sequencing, uh, RNA sequencing or cage, which is a sort of RNA sequencing that has been produced in an unbiased way. By the way, we also generated. In many analyses, we generated the set of the CoI models. Uh, we actually just took our new models and we moved them somewhere else in the genome where there was nothing, with maintaining the structure of the of the gene, just to compare what happens, what what is what would be our expectation if this were totally random, if this were totally random models. And as you can see, there is essentially no support for the case stacks. But we had a, another. We look at another source of evidence. These are procabnet predictions. This is a uh, this is from the group of uh, group of Angel Kundes in in Stanford. This is a machine learning method that predicts uh, that actually assess the assess the the likelihood of of a region to be a transcription star site. And in this particular case, the support of our novel. Uh, DSS uh, transcription star sites is actually comparable comparable to the support of protein coding uh, transcription star sites and actually even larger than that of the annotated uh, annotated long non coding RNAs. So one thing that I want to emphasize away is that is that uh, is that uh, I mean this is I think it's provides the support as I said that our novel CLS are as bad or as good as the annotated long non-coding RNAs. And that's the only aim of this analysis, right? Just to 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 make clear to the community that we are not adding things that are of lesser quality of what has been added. But what we have been able to add is like there were like 10,000, more than 10,000 cages that were mapping to intergenic regions of these 200,000. Right, that, that were produced, and and I don't know actually what is the proportion. Uh, I have it somewhere of the orphan that now of the orphan of the orphan cages that now can be assigned properly to a transcription initiation site. Uh, this is what I mean that that uh, that uh, really inaccurate annotation of the of the genome helps to uh, in the functional interpretation or interpretability of the of the of the data produced in the human genome. Right, so. This helps understanding these case stacks that before could not be explained because they were occurring in intergenic regions. Now they can be attached, they can be associated to uh, to, to transcripts. Uh, this is another this is another uh, uh, this is another uh, analysis that goes into the into the same into the same into the same direction. So these are CCRs. These are candidate regulatory uh, elements that has been and that has been 
uh, this is a catalog that has been created by the ENCODE consortium based on histone modifications and other chromatin marks in which uh, about, I think it's 1.5 or 2 million such regions are mapped into the human genome. And these regions are classified with respect to whether they are close or far away from genes. This is PLS, proximal promoter, uh, sorry, promoter regions. This is proximal enhancers, this still enhancers. And because of our annotation, because of our annotation, we have been able to reclassify what was called uh, distal enhancers, I think, into exactly. So these were before our, before our, this is in code 27. Yes, before our data, right? Before our data, so we're able to to reclassify things that were considered distal to proximal, right? So now we have more proximal things before we have more distal things. So I'm doing this correctly, right? Uh, this is a uh, this is this is another analysis that we have done. Uh, in this particular case, what we're looking at is that chipset peaks. Uh, mapping to the transcription star site again of the of these novel novel elements which we call CLS transcripts compared to annotated long coding RNAs to protein coding genes. So this is the density of uh, of chipset peaks. This is a huge collection of chipset peaks, 64 that has been that we have collapsed into 64 million unique chipset peaks along the human genome. And this is the density as we approach as we approach to the transcription star site. And we clearly see that we see the expected part, pa a pattern of increased density of transcription star sites, uh, well, finding of transcription star sites as measured by chip check experiments as we approach the transcription star site. The effect is weaker than for protein coding genes, as is to some extent as expected as well, uh, because these experiments are done in bulk. Maybe, maybe this. Transcripts, as I said, probably is expressed only in a subset of cells, but of course it's totally it's a strong effect compared to the required transcripts that they show any enrichment when, when they approach the transcription of the site. So one of the one of the best ways to demonstrate that uh, that uh, some annotation in the human genome is functional is to associate this annotation with a function, right? Say, so, well, this gene or this transcript is associated to this function. If I disrupt the gene, I have an impact of this function. We do not have these experiments yet. We have an indirect way of assessing this, that is through the GWAS uh, signal, right? So as you know, GWAS are single nucleotide polymorphisms that have been that have been associated to some particular trait, right? And there is a catalog now of about uh, maybe 200,000, maybe 200,000 positions in the genome that have been associated to GWAS hits. And this is the density of GWAS hits as we approach to the, to the body of the gene, right? And as you can see, in intergenic in our models, in the long non-coding RNAs, in the protein coding genes, the density right, is higher than in the decoy models, which is lower. This can also be seen here with the sorry, with the, some sort of I don't know, for example, stripes marking the beginning at the end of the gene. I don't know why this is the case, but we see in long encoding in annotated long encoding carnage in protein coding genes. We also see it in our intergenic models. So another way of seeing this is that the expected number of uh, hits per of US hits per 100 kilobases along the genome is. 4.2, uh, protein coding genes, of course, have a much larger density of 16. Uh, annotated long coding RNAs have nine, more than twice the expectation, and our novel models have even larger uh, density of 10 in GWAS hits per 100 kilobases. Again, uh, our novel loci includes a large fraction, more than 50% of the 100,000 previously intergenic GWAS, so GWAS that could not be understood in the sense that it was not possible to assign them to any genic element, now can be hard mapped within the boundaries of a, of, of a gene 
and this brings out the percentage of non-genic GWAS from 35% to 16%. Again, helping to interpret the functional and uh, the function of the human genome. Again, yet another analysis. Well, we know that the regions that are functional, we show some sequence conservation. So this is the sequence conservation of both the exonic sequence and the spice junctions of our uh, of our uh, uh, novel models. And we see some excess, small excess, really, of sequence conservation in the exons, but we do see an excess of sequence conservation on the spice junctions. So the spice junctions of our of our uh, of our models of our no, novel uh, CLS transcripts are are more conserved than the expectation. Uh, I don't have the sorry. I'm making the slides, but uh, I didn't have time to finalize them. We have also been able so. I was putting this slide just now, before we were talking, by the way, before, well, well, Sedek was introducing myself. We also have a catalog of orthologs between human and mouse, uh, which I think includes about 9,000 9, orthologs, which I think is much larger than, than the number of, uh, than the number of, uh, of, uh, of other catalogs of orthologs between human and mouse in terms of long number of RNAs. And the, the interesting thing is that if we look at this is from this is Chenko 27. Uh, we have mentioned Chenko 27 because this is the this is the version of Chenko on which we with reference to which we generate our capture design. So we selected things that were intergenic with respect to version 27. And if we go to this long non-coding carnet disease database, which is a database that associates long non-coding carnet with conditions, with diseases, I mean, there were, in if we look at version 27, there were 527 genes with mouse hortologs in this database, and now we have uh, 1,500 or 1,400, almost three times more the number of Long, human long non coding carnage associated to disease with non mouse portalogs. And let me finish uh, about with this. Uh, this is the work in progress with some, as well as some other work that we are doing. So we wanted to have a more direct uh, evidence of the potential functionality of this novel transcript. So we did the meta analysis of uh, the last collection of uh, RNA seq data sets uh, from individuals suffering from neurodegenerative and psychiatric disorders and the corresponding controls. And we did a uh, differential gene expression. So the idea is, will we be able to find differential genes that are differentially expressed among the novel genes that we predict in some human conditions and we focus on this for whatever reasons, right? So we focus on the brain in diseases. So this is one particular case, Alzheimer in different areas of the brain and these different studies, put all, all of them together. Well, maybe uh, maybe this is just one 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 exa one of the studies. So here we see here we see the in red, in darker red, is the is the number of genes that are Differentially expressed, significantly differentially expressed, uh, with a fold change than more than 0. Point, log fold change is more than 0. 0.5. Uh, and, and as you can see, we have some candidates. Um, I don't want to claim anything. I mean, this could be many things, but in total, when we look at all the brain regions and at all the conditions, we found about 500 of our novel annotated genes and transcripts that were not present before in the annotation differentially expressed in one of these in one of these conditions, right? And this is just one example. This is a gene, a novel, a novel gene, which is this one here, uh, uh, which is supported by many by many reads. This is I, this, I guess that this is just uh, was captured. Right, so there was nothing here before. And this is a gene that's specifically expressed. Well, when we look into this database, this is specifically in the cerebellum. And uh, 
this is a gene that's uh, overexpressed in Alzheimer's disease compared to controls in this level, as I said, but also in the temporal lobe. Um, so, what I just wanted to say is that we have now a set of genes, novel genes that were not in Chenkel before, that were not annotated before. Some were on this on these catalogs of clonal coding RNA, some were not in any catalog, about half and half, I would say. Um, and these are not predictions. These are not predictions, these are not predictions derived from short term RNA seq. So these are, I mean, we have full length RNA seqs that support the connectivity of the exon. So these are transcripts that exist. I said whether they have any role or not, it's a different thing. But these transcripts exist in at least in one cell type in a condition with, suffic with sufficient uh, abundance that can be that they can be detected. Uh, we think that this is maybe only the beginning. That there are many other factors that need to be taken into account. Many other conditions or experimental conditions that are being taken into account. If you just want to to map, like have a complete map of genes and transcripts. And one, of course, is the limited diversity of samples that are available in the in the omics community, which this I mean that most of the genome sequencing, most of the chip check experiments, most of the RNA experiments are made are, are carried out in, in cells of tissues that are from obtained uh, uh, from individuals of uh, European ancestry, right? So this is an important bias that may have impact on the capacity on the, of, of, the, of the advances of, of genomic medicine to benefit all humanity the same. So there is now, uh, this is a concern in the genomics area and there is this effort to generate the pan genome, which is the generation of high quality genomes from Populations of diverse genetic origin. And uh, there is the pan genome now is built from about 47 high quality genomes from populations of diverse origin. And we are now doing the equivalent in what called the human pan transcriptome, generating long uh, RNA sequencing from samples of different genetic backgrounds, some of which are in the, in the pan genome. Uh, but unfortunately, I hope I will, was going to have some results, but we don't have any results. Hopefully soon, we have everything sequenced. We are now analyzing it now for, a while, for quite quite some time, uh, but uh, we don't have yet results. Um, so let me finish here. Uh, so I think I already took over uh, all the time given to me. This is a, on the left is a picture of a chain code consortium. Uh, on the right is the people in my group that uh, have been working on this. It's Karma, Tamara, Silvio and Gazal, and Emilio. I don't see him because there's a window that covers his face. That's the people that have been that have been uh, working on producing and analyzing the data together with uh, with uh, former collaborators past, Barbara and Rory, some of you know, and from the people from the Havana team. And we have really a, within the chain code consortium, we are working very, very close with the with the Havana team, the, the team of annotators. And I leave it here. I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any or whatever. So let me stop sharing screen. Thanks a lot, rest. Roderick. This was an amazing talk and uh, this is really advanced knowledge. Like if long not coding RNA were worth money, we could get rich now and probably we'd go to jail for privileged information. But this is uh, this is an amazing development. So, uh, does anybody have a, a question for Roderick? No, oh, it's Silver. No. <laughs> I have oh, I have oh, three oh, questions. Oh, oh we, we'll start with yeah. Sarah. <laughs> Okay. Um, yes, very nice, uh, very nice presentation. Thanks. Um, I was wondering, maybe you 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 said it already, but uh, for the long non-coding RNAs, do you often find? Uh, Different TSS per gene, or uh, and are they supported by uh... yeah, yeah. TSS per gene? Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, 
we haven't looked at, I don't know now what is the average number of TSS per gene because you know, you know some of the analysis, I mean, there are so many inconsistencies because there are so many people working on this. One of the main problems of this project and of this paper actually is that the fact that everybody considers things in a different way. This is my fault, of course, because I should be coordinating this. But yes, yes, we, we in some cases we take the more for some analysis the more upstream one, but in general there are more than one TSS per gene. Per gene yeah. Okay. When you talk about cre the reassignment of a cis regulatory element from the the the, the encode catalog, you say uh, that there are several that go from distal enhancers to proximal enhancers. But do you also yeah. find some that uh, go from enhancer uh, signature to promoter signature? I think that, sorry, I really should know this, but I think from enhancer to promoter, you have to have and also a difference in histone modifications, right? It's not only, it's not uh, only, yes. it's not only the proximity. I think, oh, okay. yeah, I think okay. that the, the promoter signal is different than the enhancer signal. Oh, but, yeah. okay. yes, but to be honest, uh, Sarah, these yeah. things that enhancers, when they are proximal to the genes, they are promoters. Uh, yeah, I forgot about the marks, yes. Okay, and uh, finally, I wanted to know how you assign the ontology between uh, long non conic RNA genes between human and mouse. Do you, do you use a specific yes. pipeline or? Yes, yes, yes. Well, I did this work. This was done by Barbara Finca. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and they have this pipeline called Connector, and that I do not know do not know how it works. I'm sorry, I should. You never you never should talk about things that you don't know how they work. But one thing that I wanted to say is that. The way in which we design our experiment, which I did not mention, actually enrich for sequencing of orthologous pairs because we generated the probes into the human genome for mm -hmm. targeting, and then we map them, we lift it over over the mouse genome. So a mm -hmm. large number of our probes are orthologous mm -hmm. in the human mm -hmm. genome, and because we use much tissues in human and mouse. Right, I think that in our post-capture samples, there is an enrichment of orthologous uh, genes, which I think has facilitated the, I mean, this method doesn't use the fact, which I think it should have, it used the fact that we have generated, that the, we have targeted orthologous sites in human and mouse to start with, right? Mm -hmm. And then it should facilitate the assignment of orthology. It does not use it, but the data is enriched for our followers, uh, transcripts between human and mouse. Yeah. But on the graphs, on the graphs you were showing, the mouse to human and human to mouse seem to be roughly symmetrical. Yeah. yeah. So that would say this is not so much of an issue, no? Because if if uh, if, if you were ignoring big chunks on one side, this will maybe a little bit less symmetrical, no? Uh you mean this plot, right? Uh, I mean the two, the two. Yeah, exactly. The two, the two bar plot. They should be. If there was such a bias starting from human, then when you do the reverse, it should be a little bit less conserved. No. Uh, I'd have to think. Sorry. <laughs> Me too, because I don't know what these numbers mean either now, because it's 29,000, I don't know, I need to talk to, I mean, I just put this slide while you were presenting me, introducing me. I because should have I, done a longer introduction, I know, I, okay. I apologize. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and uh, because one thing, of course, a selling, a selling point of this is this thing here, right, that now, of course, it depends on, but now we have orthologs, mouse orthologs for a larger number of human lot non that are involved in disease. I mean, that's, that's what I want to say, but I really need to, I really need to, it, it, the pipeline is called Connector, uh, and uh, I think that now it's being written in, this, in the supplementary method, so I will have an idea of how this works. So we, we have some questions to Silva, but I, I, just before, these pipelines, are they written in next flow or a mixture, or what is your favorite, what is a favorite Pipeline language across all of these very very well, long. You know models. that you know that your compatriot Sylvain was using uh, a snake make for. Uh, uh -huh. for uh, but uh, I don't understand why. But uh, I think Tajin is next flow. Uh huh. And uh, 
I don't know, connector. Most likely, we will re-engineer Lyric uh, in NextFlow, actually. That's what Emilio is doing now, okay. right? So, but connector, I have no idea, to be honest. But I think it's, uh, it could be really good if they could be put into NextFlow. And Tajin, maybe not, it's not even a computational pipeline. Well, I guess that part of it is computational. I think, in general, the EBI goes NextFlow, I think. Yeah. And this is, and this is an EBI pipeline. Sorry, Silva. <laughs> you can you can explain to us why why you're using SnakeMate. No, no, no. I, I'm not. <laughs> yes, Julien, not Sylvain, Julien. Julien, ah, Julien. Yes. Julien. Julien. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. Hi, uh -huh. hi, Rodrik. Uh, nice. Hi. To you. Uh, sorry, for some reason, I, my camera is not working. Um, I, I, uh, I was wondering this this um, this non coding RNA. So they are annotated as non-coding because uh, I guess they do not contain like a typical uh, coding sequence. Uh, but I was wondering, uh, is it possible that some of them uh, might actually be coding, but coding for small proteins like microproteins or small peptides with uh, small coding sequences that are too small to make them, you know, annotated by, uh, by typical uh, annotation pipelines? Yes, actually, that's a very good question because actually this is something that this is something that Myralba has done. Uh, you know Myralba from the from the from the meme. Uh, she they they have this pipeline, or well, maybe there is a pipeline that exists that uh, that uh, uh, analyzes uh, ribosic data sets, right? Ribosic data sets, and uh, and uh, they have found. That about uh, let me let me I'll show it to you. No, is this one? No, no. Yes, we do. We have done this. Uh, we have done and long and 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 what are the numbers that they had here for some reason? Uh, uh, one second. Uh, I'll tell you the numbers that we get um, for non for non canonical translation. Uh, Overall, we identified 45,198 40, 45, non-coding non or, or with translation signatures in CLS transcripts. So indeed, yes, there are, right? So 18% of our transcripts, 18% of our transcripts had uh, uh, using ribosic data had some evidence of uh, non-canonical ORFs. Yeah. This is actually, this is actually a small, this is there's one of the things in which this is less than four, less than four, uh, and the total non coding carnage, which is 26%. Yeah, well, oh. yeah, the, the ribosic needs to be performed on the same tissue, of course, and, and so on. Yes. So that could explain yes. also why yeah, it's difficult to get them. Yes. Yes. But I guess we, that, that there might be some uh, clever way to uh, to find these small coding sequences. Uh, you know, gene finding was uh, easy on long genes. So now maybe there are new ways to to uh, to perform some ab initio you know gene gene finding on the on, for for those small proteins i think that this was yeah that's a possibility using ab initio but the problem is that they are small and therefore they don't have the coding bias it's difficult to measure and also the conservation is difficult to measure in this case they use a program i'm not familiar with this called reward okay thanks hmm. thanks Thank you, Silva. I, if nobody has any right. question, I have one actually. So, uh, Roderick, you made a very convincing case that this is uh, not noise. That these are not uh, that random DNA sequences do not get treated this way. But of course, we are still short of knowing if these things really have a function or not. And so, I have a very simple question: Do you think there is some kind of benefits of being transcribed for a sequence that could explain something that would be like selfish transcription, you know, that once a sequence has acquired, however, all the hallmark for being transcribed, then it's easier for the cell to maintain it as a transcribed sequence than letting it decay as something that could become harmful while it decay. And so that yeah, could explain why, why you have all of these transcripts and they are maintained even though they may have no function, but that would suggest that they, there is a benefit no, of remaining a, a transcribed sequence. So, 
I mean, I think it's sort of maybe I mean I'm ignorant on this totally, but I think it's very simple, no? So you have a pool of nucleotides in the cell, right? Of A, C, G, and this, and they can be in the genome. They are always there, so there's no variation. They can be free, or they can be on RNA molecules. So maybe it, it is better for them to be on RNA molecules than to be free. They may be free. They may be interfering with other uh, metabolic pathways or whatever, and it's just or maybe it's just a way of storing them when they are needed, when a gene has to be expressed very rapidly or something. So the thing is that the number of nucleotides in the cell, you are not going to change. You can have them yeah. free or you can have them in RNA molecules. That's the, not in DNA because you don't create DNA de novo. So RNA. Uh -huh. Now, your question makes a lot of sense. I always, I think I thought on this um, very often, right? So, well, you have the, the, the nucleotides, they, and maybe there are regions that are for whatever reason, because they have a higher accumulation of binding to transcription factors, just are transcribed, and then you get the RNAs there. These RNAs may not play any role in any metabolic pathway. Maybe, 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 I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's, a, a, that's a total possibility. They are uh, reservoirs, or they are a way of maybe nucleotides, free nucleotides are toxic for the cell. Uh, they could interfere with many other metabolites. And then the way of is making them in jail with another one. I don't know. Uh, it's a possibility. Because I, I have this French obsession for uh, petroleum, and so I was looking. Well, let me just the 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 the, the last paper I had on the petroleum annotation is almost almost ten years old, and there are almost no long non-coding RNA in petroleum. Do you know if this has changed? No, nope, no, but this... like petroleum, you know. Uh, 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 the uh, exofish. The fish. The fish. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Ah, the you know the one, yeah. the, one, the, one, the, one, the one that you call you used, like. Yes, 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 yes. It's so cool. and, and this one is super compact. And so in 2016, at the latest uh, large scale annotation I have of that stuff, they had something like uh, a few hundred long non coding RNA. But it means nothing. You know, it could mean that they well, don't know. I mean, it, uh, this is the point, right? This is really. Strong point. The same vertebrate can live without bone and body RNA, so they may not be as important. I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's a good question. It's true. I mean, actually, looking for bone and body RNA would be of interest because there's not much space for them to be encoded. So, uh, I mean, yeah, one of the ironies is that I am myself not. Very fun of long non coding RNAs. <laughs> and actually, everybody is in long non coding RNAs, and now I get this result of so many long non coding RNAs. So it's a little bit of a shame, but this is what it is. And of course, I'm now biased to try to find function of them because since I'm discovering so many, we want them to be important. Because if nobody has any question, and I don't want to take more of your time, but do you think this goes back? Do you think that this now squares with this debate about 300,000 genes in the human genome, you know, in the uh, sh uh, shortly before the human genome was to be delivered, there were this very these massive numbers that were extracted from uh, from uh, from um, from ESTs and all these kind of things. Yeah, no, so I think that this is interesting. Yeah, it is. It is actually. Is there, it, it, I think that the I mean, this is a very interesting. This is a very interesting uh, case of how our interpretation of the data depends on our biases and our ignorance. Because there were this when Hughes produced this paper in which he predicted only 25,000, 30,000 genes, 30, in the, something, you know, yeah, yeah. which was much less than everybody else. They were predicting 80,000, 100,000. So the thing is that the work of uh, Huge was based on comparative genomics, right? So he was aligning the human to the Google or the tetrodon. Yeah, 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 yeah. And of course, when you do these comparisons, you can only can identify protein coding genes. Long non coding RNAs are not conserved. Therefore, mm -hmm. he was counting, he was counting, he was counting protein coding genes. And he got it right a little bit over actually. The funny thing, he overestimated the number of human genes, but at that time it was a so at the same time, there were at the same the same issue, I think, of nature genetics, or maybe there were two other papers, right? Based on ESTs, 
One predicted 60,000 genes, the other predicted uh, 120,000. So we are talking about the year 2000. So there was nothing about long non-coding RNAs, nobody knew about long non-coding RNAs, and nobody knew about alternative splicing. So everybody assumed that some of these numbers had to be wrong because they were counting the human genes. But the fact is that none of them are wrong in a sense because the group that predicted 60,000, the, the difference between the group predicted 60,000 and 120,000 was the stringency with which they use the cutoff to consider two STs the same, right? You have many STs, and then depending on the overlap, you consider them the same or different. So the group that predicted 60,000 was very stringent, so everything was collapsed or less stringent, depending on how you use the word stringent. So they were counting protein coding genes and long non coding RNAs that were unknown at that time, but they were counting genes still. The group that was predicted 120,000 was predicted transcripts. Because uh -huh. they were like stringent on mapping things. So the thing is that everybody was counting different things and everybody was thinking that they were counting the same thing for genes. But <laughs> one group was counting protein coding genes, the other group was counting protein coding genes and long non-coding RNAs, and the other group was counting transcripts. And then 30,000, 60,000, 120,000. Yeah. I think it's really a nice example of how really yeah. our lack of understanding. It, it's very difficult to understand our data if we don't know what happens on, in the world. Yeah. And that, that, is that? So, yeah, it's the problem of the definition, actually, because, you know, you can't count something that is not correctly defined. Uh, so as long as we don't have, a, like, a consensus about what is a gene, then, of course, you know. Yeah, yeah, but at this time, is it, at that time, it was even, it was not, is that... Yeah, well, even consider yes. alternative splicing or long non coding RNAs. This idea yeah, didn't yeah. exist in the community. Nobody suspected that there could be 20,000 long non coding RNAs yeah. and that most genes produce alternative splice. I suppose the consensus was that genes produce proteins, one protein is still, I mean, in 2000, really. But of course, you're totally right. It depends on how you, and this is the case, it depends on what you define and what you're counting. But that's fascinating because, and I probably I will propose we wrap up on this. You define on what you have observed so far, and of course your observation going to the unknown. And right now, as we are just about embarking in the Earth's biogenome with 1.5 million species, it's almost 100% sure that new unknown is waiting for us, and that all of the things we take for granted in terms of definition will have to be requestioned. I think there is a very well-established theory in the in in in, in uh, in, in, uh, in the history of science, that each time you get new data, the existing theories burst open and have to be redefined. And I don't think there is any counterexample in, in the history of science where new data did not break open everything that was established. And so, Roderick, thanks a lot for giving us all of this insider knowledge in what is to come and what happened 20 but, uh, yeah, years ago. Should... It's just a few hours because the bit 47 will be released tomorrow. So I know, but I've I've, I've already started by, by, buying transcripts. So I've, I've already okay. bought 10,000 transcripts. So it's it's already uh, and so thanks a lot, Roderick, and and Thank to you. all of you today listening to this and of course listening to the to the to the podcast. So uh, this is very relevant to our work here because all of these things happening in gene code, in mouse, in human, are bound to happen in all the species we are interested in. And uh, it's very clear that the complex relation between GWAS, one of the most convincing argument for the community on this channel is the GWAS. You know, everybody working with farm animal is obsessed with improving breeding, and this is all about GWAS. And Roderick made a very strong case that the long node coding RNA matter to genetics. How, why, how it happens, we don't know. But you know, you can see that uh, the newly defined long non coding RNA is a score of 10 in your scale as compared to, to 15 in proteins. Something interesting is going on. So thanks a lot, Roderick. Next month, we will have Harris Lewin, who will tell us about oh, yes. the first. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're welcome to attend, Roderick. And yes, Harris will 
will tell us about the Earth biogenome and the latest development and, of course, the complex relation between the Earth biogenome and the animal genomics, the farm animal genomics, and uh, everything uh, animal breeders are interested in. And till then, uh, goodbye. I don't know, Bjorn, if we have any other uh, uh, announcement we want to make before. No, I just would session. add that due to the time difference, we will shift the meeting then next month by one hour. And That's correct.